Okay, everybody. Um, my clock, which is a cell phone, says 931. This stuff up there says 933. So we'll take a average of 932. And that means that we probably want to get started. Let's have everybody settle down. Look, you belong in the front row. All right. So really welcome everybody and please um, come on in and get yourself situated. It is really a very, very special uh, day for us and for the university, I think, in terms of having the 10th annual Conte Center Symposium. It kind of snuck up on me and didn't realize that it is. Um, we're not really in our 10th year of the county center, but we had a bridge year and we did hold a symposium in here. And the reason we did that is because part of what the county center is all about is not only the research that we do, um, but actually reaching out to the UCI community and the community in Southern California and beyond that. Um, as many of you know, uh, the county center does not only have symposia, but it has a seminar series that everybody's invited to and actually our monthly meetings are open to all of you. And there are people in the audience who, although not a, perhaps a direct funded part of the county center, are affiliates and really members of the broad community of the county center, because what we all are interested to do, doing together is really understanding the dynamics of the brain throughout development. We don't quite go to aging. And again, how that dynamic is altered um, by early life experiences, late life experiences, and how that may influence disease. So this is really the topic of the current symposium, which is the dynamic brain in mental health and disease. And the term dynamic is really quite dynamic all by itself. And you can really interpret it any way you want. But we'll give throughout the day a number of examples of dynamism, if you will, related to sex, related to age, related to experience, and also computational and um, theoretical conceptual approaches to how to handle it, which is the first keynote speaker. Um, so if I can have the slide, please. So just really quickly go over the agenda. And again, there's very little housekeeping that we need to do. Um, right after me, there will be a fantastic introduction by Professor Jeff Abbott, the Vice Dean for Research and Senior Associate Dean for Academic Affairs. Did I get it right? Or did I switch it? Okay, good. Um, then we'll have a keynote speaker who will be doing this virtually, uh, Danny Bassett, a pioneer and a leader in um, the field. And I'm not going to say anything more about that. Mike Yasso will introduce her. We'll have a quick break. And then we'll have two talks, one by Nobert, who's sitting right here. Thank you for coming, Nobert. And uh, one by Emily Jacobs. And um, we'll have a little bit of a break. Then we'll have poster tours. This year, the posters would mainly be out here in the atrium so there'll be plenty of space. I know there was a little cramp last time. We have five poster tours. So each poster will have five, six minutes for really good discussion. Ask all the hard questions, please. And then we'll have lunch. Um, that will be followed by data blades. We worked really hard. It was almost impossible to choose five of the posters that were submitted to the abstract as data blitzes. And they are amazing. So hang on to your hats. And finally, we'll have the second keynote talk by Professor Jill Becker from Michigan, who's sitting right here in the front row. And then we will uh, call it a day. So thank you for being here. And uh, let's go for the ride. And with this, I am uh, delighted to invite uh, Professor Jeff Abbott to tell us a little bit about the County Center and particularly UCI. So take it away, Jeff. Thank you very much, Dr. Baram. Um, I'm really um, sincerely like to thank you, Tally. Um, you are the um, distinguished professor here at UCI. As we all know, you're Donald, ben, Donald Bren Professor as well, which is one of the most prestigious titles at UCI, and Danette Shepard, uh, Professor of Neurological Sciences. Um, and you asked me not to say all that stuff, but I did anyway, and director of this Conti Center. So I'm really, really grateful to you. Um, for the invitation to deliver this welcome message this morning. Um, I'm honored to welcome everybody here. Um, 
to the Conti Center 10th Annual Symposium, the Dynamic Brain in Health and Disease. In the next few minutes, I'll briefly discuss the growth of UCI School of Medicine, which is fueled by centers of research excellence such as the Conti Center. Um, and I'll include some recent exciting developments in our expansion, and then I'll it briefly introduce the highly prestigious Conta Center at UCI. So as you can see from my first slide, we have a number of key goals, charting the path in UCI School of Medicine from 2020 to 2025, involving research distinction, innovative education, clinical excellence, and the goal to be uh, become and remain a complex care leader um, in the region. As you can see, uh, our growth of research portfolio has been Stunning from 203 million in FY19 to 340 million in FY23. If we look at the number of federal awards obtained by School of Medicine faculty, they're also increasing at a dramatic rate from 703 in 2017 to 940 in 2022. And of course, we have the magnificent faculty and UCI School of Medicine to thank for this. So we have some exciting new developments uh, coming in the School of Medicine. In September 2021, we announced a $30 million lead gift from the Falling Leaves Foundation for a planned state-of-the-art medical research facility on the UCI campus. Many of you will have noticed parking got a little bit more difficult recently at the medical school um, because we broke ground in February on, on a new state-of-the-art Falling Leaves Foundation medical innovation building. Scheduled to open in summer 2025, and it's still on schedule right now, it's very early, um, there'll be 200,000 square feet, two thirds of which are assignable research space. We're going to have the very best of translational research in there from all um, schools in the College of Health Sciences. Um, and we're really super excited about this. No one more excited than me because I have to deal with the space issues in the School of Medicine. And I, I'm happy to announce that the parking structure, the new parking structure will be fully open in the next few weeks as well. So our parking issues will be resolved. So yeah, that's always the most exciting part. It's all about the parking, right? Um, so Plumwood House as well. Many of you know and love Plumwood House. Um, we currently occupy wet lab space on the first floor and we have for many years, but more recently, we entered an agreement for additional space on the second and third floor. We've already occupied almost all that space and what isn't occupied now is occupied on paper. And I'm very excited to also say that we, um, we are very close. I can't say anything yet. We can't guarantee it to acquiring even more space in Plumwood, including their parking. So we are hoping to take the, the rest of Plumwood House very soon. And that agreement is kind of, um, the discussions are ongoing, but that will give us a vital kind of stopgap uh, before the, the uh, new Falling Lease Foundation building is open. Because as you can see from our awards, uh, we are doing phenomenally well. We're hiring more people, but the people who are, who are here are getting more awards as well in terms of research uh, grant awards. So, so we just need to accommodate them and all their fantastic research. Now over to the more clinical side, uh, we are, as you know, breaking new ground in that area too. In August 2022, we broke ground on the new 1.3 billion, 165,000 square foot UCI Medical Center Irvine facility. Um, you can probably see it. I can see it from my lab window. I can see the cranes. It's, it's so close. It's super exciting. And this is going to basically transform the way that UCI Health uh, does business and, and treats patients um, and serves our community in Orange County and Irvine. In terms of other clinical research, uh, infrastructure investments, we've recently spent over $30 million in the following areas, the Center for Innovative Health Therapies uh, in Orange, the Alpha Clinic School of Medicine um, Cell Therapy Center in Gross Hall. Um, IT infrastructure has been improved. We created a new administrative central unit for CCR and ICTS, which are the um, Center for Clinical Research and the Institute for Clinical and Translational Sciences at UCI, that's at Orange too, and established an investigational drug pharmacy for clinical trials. So both our basic and our through translation to clinical research is, is, is massively on the up. In terms of other clinical research um, infrastructure investments, really excited to say that this summer, we'll be opening the new cellular GMP facility for manufacturing experimental cell and gene therapies. It has seven manufacturing suites and a viral vector lab, and that's in Hewitt Hall basement. Uh, we'll be opening a spring 2023, a cell processing laboratory in building 55 at Orange, uh, a dedicated cell and gene therapy unit with dedicated beds, additional on-site cell processing lab will be opening in 2025 and opening in March 2023, a mixed use clinical and research PET scanner at Pacific Medical Plaza in Costa Mesa. So you can see we, we are growing as a school, um, both just in quantity, but also in quality. Um, and there's phenomenal transformational research being done at UCI School of Medicine, which brings me very nicely 
to the phenomenal Conti Center at UCI. So in 2019, the National Institute of Mental Health awarded the Conti Center team led by Tali um, Baram a five-year, $15 million Silvio O. Conte Center grant. The renewed funding has allowed Dr. Baram's interdisciplinary team to continue their cutting edge research, studying how unpredictable parental environmental signals influence an infant's vulnerability later in life to cognitive and emotional problems, such as risky behaviors, addiction, and post-traumatic stress disorder. So the, obviously the potential impact of this is, is huge, short-term, medium-term, and long-term, because it could potentially can benefit generations of people to come. Conti Center addresses how early life experiences, especially adversity, influence brain maturation and contribute to vulnerability to mental health problems throughout life. The center already in their research already have identified unpredictable chaotic sensory signals from parents or environment as an important novel type of adversity, which is, and this is really important, amenable to prevention. So without, without that part, you know, this is a very interesting uh, molecular mechanistic neurobiology. With that part, it becomes trans translational and transformative. One of only 12 such centers in a country, members of this highly prestigious center publish in the very best journals, including science, PNAS, and Nature Communications recently. Um, and the center also reaches out to our community at UCI and beyond, holds monthly meetings, seminars, uh, and is open to affiliates as well. So it brings together people from multiple UCI schools and beyond. So the Conti Center at UCI played a major role um, in a collaborative team led by Dr. Bram, centered in UCI and including both CHOC, our Children's Hospital, and um, Chapman University, um, to be awarded a more than $2.3 million grant to address the health impacts of adverse childhood experience, or ACE, ACEs, as part of the California uh, Initiative to Advance Precision Medicine. So their team is investigating in 100,000 children the degree to which unpredictability of early life experiences interacts with established ACEs to influence children's neurodevelopment and employ a novel epigenetic approach with the goal of discovering for each child a marker that can predict their level of resilience. So targeted in interventions can be delivered to children who need them most. So it's just one of the most exciting things about being um, a basic translational or clinical science scientist at UCI School of Medicine is seeing the things that we discover at fundamental science level um, coming to fruition and being used in the clinic or even, even better preventing uh, illness in the first place. So I just really want to say this is an amazing center. The work of Dr. Baram and all the colleagues here is incredible. Uh, School of Medicine uh, leadership uh, is deeply indebted to you for all the wonderful things you continue to do. And so I'd just like to say um, thank you. And also thank you for listening to me this morning. I realize now I'm considerably shorter than Jeff, so I have to bring this down. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Mike Yassa. I'm a professor in neurobiology and behavior, and I am uh, one of the co-investigators in the Conti Center, and I'm delighted to introduce our first keynote speaker today. So our first uh, keynote speaker today is the J. Peter Skirkenick Professor at the University of Pennsylvania, with appointments in the departments of bioengineering, electrical and systems engineering, physics and astronomy, neurology, and psychiatry. They are also an external professor of the Santa Fe Institute. They are most well known for blending neural and systems engineering to identify fundamental mechanisms of cognition and disease in human brain networks. They received a bachelor's degree in physics from Penn State University and a PhD in physics from the University of Cambridge as a Churchill scholar and as an NIH uh, health sciences scholar. Following postdoctoral work at the uh, University of California, Santa Barbara, they were a junior research fellow at the SAGE Center for the Study of the Mind and they have received multiple, in fact, too many to enumerate, prestigious awards. I'll just highlight a few, uh, including the American Psychological Association's Rising Star Award, the Alfred P. Sloan Research Fellowship, the MacArthur Fellow Genius Grant, and I should note they were the youngest to ever have received this honor, and uh, early career awards from the IEEE Engineering and Medicine and Biology Society, the Office of Naval Research, and the Organization for Human Brain Mapping, and just too many other awards to mention in this introduction. They are a fellow of the American Physical Society and were named one of the Web of Science's most highly cited researchers for three years running. 
In 2016, they were named one of the 10 most brilliant scientists of the year by Popular Science Magazine. Our esteemed speaker is the author of more than 400 peer-reviewed publications, which have garnered over 40,000 citations, and has been the recipient of funding from numerous federal sources and private foundations. Most recently, they co-authored with philosopher and twin Perry Zern, a new book titled Curious Minds, The Power of Connection, published by MIT Press. I highly recommend it. I just finished it yesterday. A terrific read, a, a true page turner. Um, it is impossible to overstate the magnitude of their contributions thus far and the impact their work has had on the field of network neuroscience, as well as several other interconnected fields in biology and physics. We are delighted that they accepted our invitation to be one of our keynotes today and are joining us over Zoom. I hope that we can pull up the, the Zoom connection, or am I supposed to do something on my end here? I'm not sure. Okay, well, with that, please join me in a very warm welcome to our distinguished keynote speaker, Professor Danny Bassett. Thank you. Um, thank you for that extremely kind introduction uh, and also for the opportunity to be with you here virtually today. I'm really um, excited to contribute to this special day for everyone as the 10th uh, annual symposium of the Conti Center. Um, what I wanted to do today was to talk about understanding brain network modulation. <clears throat> And um, to start and sort of frame my remarks, I wanted to begin by noting that many biological systems are organized as networks. And the function of these systems is made possible by that pattern of interconnections along which items of interest, for example, nutrients, goods, or information can be routed. So for example, we can think about an organ network at the largest scale, cellular networks at intermediate scales, molecular and genetic networks at lower scales, and they are all um, places along which uh, information, goods, and nutrients can travel in the individual. Moreover, we can go beyond a single individual to understand social networks where, again, information can be transmitted and routed along um, communication pathways. So biological systems in general are organized in this fashion, and that allows for them to function in the way that they do. The brain is one notable example of a networked biological system. It is comprised of regions that perform specific functions and engage in particular computations. And in fact, over the last many decades, um, very important work has been done in the area of brain mapping to understand the function of individual brain regions. In uh, humans, these particular functions and the computations that are associated with them are typically studied using non-invasive imaging techniques, for example, um, magnetic resonance imaging. And in non-human animals, um, these are studied in different, a different fashion. But importantly, those regions that are identified and whose functions and computations are, start, are being understood are interconnected by large white matter tracks. Each tract is a bundle of neuronal axons along which information bearing electrical signals can propagate. So importantly, those signals can be intrinsic from neural processing or they can be extrinsic from applied stimulation, which is partly what I'm interested in discussing today. And therefore, understanding structural network constraints, so how the brain is um, wired, is key to understanding healthy brain function, but also stimulation-based interventions uh, for disease and for um, other conditions. Now, I want to think a little bit about these structural constraints. What are they? How do we understand them? How is the field investigating them? I'll note that recent efforts have expanded the investigation of structural constraints or the structural connectome or network in the brain um, in several ways. The first is that there has been an explosion of increasingly sensitive measurements. So for example, in humans, we will often use diffusion weighted MRI, um, and that has become increasingly sensitive to microstructural integrity and provides estimates of tract locations at finer and finer spatial resolutions. This increasing sensitivity is made possible by a markedly increased scan time, so sometimes scans um, lasting an hour, and also a marked increase in the number of diffusion directions from early um, approaches using 30 directions to now using you know, over 700 sometimes. Those um, changes in the way in which we are collecting these data allow for us to map 
the um, structural connectivity in finer and finer detail, such that we can now have images that look like this, which I always think um, reminds me of a shag carpet. Uh, but here, as you can see, is a, a picture of um, tract structure in a healthy human brain. Now, in addition to these changes in the sensitivity of our measurements, there's a second factor that has um, motivated an increasing expansion into the investigation of structural constraints. And that is the development of data-informed computational models. Um, these data-informed computational models quantitatively assess how any particular network architecture affects the brain's potential or actual dynamical repertoire and its response to stimulation. Now, the third factor, in addition to the increasingly sensitive measurements and the data-informed computational models, the third factor that has um, been important in the expansion of investigations into structural constraints is a conceptual shift in explanations for interventions. So if you go back through the history of um, cognitive neuroscience um, and its relation to um, psychiatry and neurology, you'll find that there is a predominance of activity-based explanations earlier on in the field. Um, and that has moved to also incorporate structure-based explanations. Now this expansion in the type of explanations um, that we use is helpful for understanding the efficacy of stimulation-based interventions. So is it that stimulation is effective because it alters the activity of a brain region? Or is it that stimulation is effective because that stimulation flows along structural um, connections to impact many other brain regions and their activity. Now, if we think about stimulation as a dynamical process that is constrained by the structural network connecting brain regions, then that necessitates that we include structure-based explanations and activity-based explanations when evaluating the, um, the uh, function and efficacy of stimulation. So together, these three efforts uh, of measurement, of modeling, and conceptual expansions are providing a richer understanding of structural constraints on neural function and stimulation. Now, what I'd like to do over the next few minutes is to focus on this last point, a conceptual shift in explanations for interventions. And after I do that, I'll actually move to the second point, the data-informed computational models. But I really want to focus on, on why this is relevant for intervention first before moving into the modeling space. To um, understand why this is important for understanding stimulation, I wanted to discuss an example of structural constraints on the um, effects of transcranial magnetic stimulation. This is work that was led by Val Sidner, who is a graduate student working with Ted Satterthwaite um, and in collaboration with Desmond Oaths. This paper just recently came out this year in Science Advances. So first, the investigators um, uh, studied 45 healthy participants who underwent a TMS um, fMRI experiment. Um, the TMS was applied to the ventral lateral prefrontal cortex, which has a known role in emotion regulation. And it was applied in an interleaved fashion, so a single pulse TMS and then functional um, MRI. You can see a graphical depiction of the structure of the study over here on the right hand side, where there's a TMS pulse um, uh, followed by uh, uh, in combination with the um, fMRI. And importantly, in the context of that data collection, uh, the investigators quantified the evoked response after um, or to the stimulation. Now, in addition to that single pulse TMS fMRI component of the study, all of the participants also underwent diffusion MRI, where a whole brain tractogram was extracted. Um, and in particular, uh, the investigators studied the fiber density between any two brain regions. Now, here's the first piece of data that I wanted to show you that demonstrates that the VLPFC neurostimulation evokes amygdala activity. 
In particular, we um, studied individual specific stimulation sites. So on the left hand side, what you're seeing is a brain where the stimulation sites for each individual are plotted in these blue dots. And they were localized to a sector of the VLPFC that was strongly functionally connected to the left amygdala. So not structurally connected, but functionally connected to the left amygdala. And then here what you see is that TMS elicited a sizable decrease in the fMRI bold response in the ipsilateral amygdala. So zero would mean that um, the uh, response is, is consistent with pre-TMS. Um, the, the fact that many of these data points are below the zero line indicates that there's a sizable decrease uh, in the bold response. Now, I also do want to note that some individuals showed a positive response of bold activity to the stimulation. And in uh, the subsequent slide, we'll separate out people people who uh, demonstrate a decrease in the fMRI bold response and people who demonstrate an increase in the fMRI bold response. But for now, I want to draw your attention to the right-hand side of this slide, where along the y-axis here, we have um, whether the evoked response in particular subcortical structures is larger or smaller than what we observed in the amygdala. Uh, so here along the x-axis is the names of uh, various subcortical structures. And what I want you to notice is that the majority of these block plots sit above the zero line, which indicates um, that evoked response magnitudes were greater in the amygdala than in most other subcortical structures. So that suggests some spatial specificity uh, to the effect. Now, Next, what we did is that we estimated the fiber density in the VLPFC amygdala pathway. So tracking uh, between these two regions and then quantifying the fiber density between them from the diffusion MRI data. What we observed is that larger TMS evoked response or larger TMS evoked changes in the amygdala were associated with higher fiber density um, in the VLPFC amygdala white matter pathway. And that's what you're seeing over here in the middle. So along the x-axis here is age-corrected fiber density. And along the y-axis here is the left amygdala uh, TMS evoked uh, response magnitude. You see a positive correlation between these two um, variables, indicating that when there was greater fiber density between the VLPFC and the amygdala, there was also a larger um, evoked response from the TMS. Now, I mentioned that I was going to separate out those individuals who responded po with a positive change in the evoked response um, bold magnitude and others that showed a negative change in the bold response. So that's what I'm showing you here on the right hand side. So um, here, what you see in the dark purple is that higher fiber density was associated with a bold decrease in these negative evoked response individuals. And then in the lighter color here, you're seeing the opposite effect. So a, a higher fiber density was associated with a bold increase in the positive evoked response individuals. So this importantly demonstrates not only that the structural connectivity matters for how um, activity is flowing through the system in response to TMS, but also that there are marked individual differences, and in particular that there are differences in how the information is flowing when individuals have a positive change in the bold response versus when they have a negative change in the bold response. So just a quick summary of that example study. The work provides evidence of amygdala engagement by TMS, highlighting stimulation of VLPFC amygdala circuits as a candidate treatment for transdiagnostic psychopathology. But more broadly, it indicates that targeting cortical subcortical structural connections may enhance the impact of TMS on subcortical neural activity and by extension, subcortex subserved behaviors. Now, with that example in your mind, what I would like to do is to turn to data-informed computational models to say, if structure is an important explanatory variable in the efficacy uh, and extent of um, the TMS response, then how can we build computational models to better understand um, that process and how we could use it to enhance effective interventions? The data-informed computational model that I wanted to focus on today is called the network control model. 
it draws upon and extends theoretical work in systems engineering. So in particular, what is um, where it is commonly used is in the study of the power grid, uh, mechanical systems, air traffic control systems, and robotics. And the basic idea of the network control model is that there is a networked dynamical system and that networked dynamical system um, produces a natural flow of dynamics that can then be modulated by external interventions. So here, for example, is a simple graph or schematic of a system that has four nodes and then four edges. And importantly, what you see in the purple is the injection of an external uh, time series of activity. So here in X1, there's an injection of the time series U1. So this is a change. You can think of this as a change or an effective stimulation, or you can think of it as um, stimuli and uh, experiences of the world that are providing information into the brain through our senses. Now, what this um, little schematic is demonstrating is that different kinds of exogenous input can be placed into different pieces of the brain. So this U1 time series is different than the U2 time series. So these interventions for these two different regions are dissimilar from one another. But how does that impact the dynamics of the system? Here on the right hand side, you see um, a state space assessment or map where the initial state of the system is at the origin. What that means is that each region or every node has zero activity in this particular example. And then as this um, external input is being placed into the system, the system moves and changes uh, its activation state to some desired final state. Now, with this framework, there are many interesting questions that we can ask. So, for example, um, what is an initial state that the brain sits in typically? What is the initial state prior to a stimulation intervention? Secondly, what is the input that we could inject into the system to drive the system toward a particular desired final state? You can think of that in a way um, that is uh, beneficial to altered dynamics in association with um, psychiatric conditions or neurological disorders. Okay, so with that goal in mind, we need to ask, well, what is the network control model um, for a brain, not for robotics or for a power grid or for air traffic control systems, but for a brain? Um, and to answer that question, I'm going to show you one simple example of um, how we can implement this for the brain, and then also note a few expansions of the model that I think are exciting and interesting. Here, what you see is a model of how activity flows along structural connections in the brain. So um, what this says is X, which is the state of the brain at time T plus one, is equal to X, or the state of the brain at time T, and then times the um, adjacency matrix, which is the pattern of structural connections between brain regions. So if I ignored this final bit over here and just focused on these two uh, bits of the expression that I just described, what this is saying is that the current state of the brain is a pattern of activity. That activity can flow along structural connections to explain what the state of the brain will be in the next time step. Um, however, it is the case that the brain is not a closed system. So that's a phrase uh, that's typically used in engineering to indicate that no input can get into the system. But the brain is not like that. The brain is what's known as an open system. There um, is an injection of input, in, many injections of input into the brain that can be exogenous um, and uh, and clinically motivated, like stimulation, but it can also be the injection of input from um, the rest of the body, from the eyes, from the ears, um, from uh, sensations, etc. So we need to be able to expand the model to include the possibility of um, exogenous uh, interactions. So that's what this last little piece is over here. So here, B sub kappa 
is a matrix, um, typically with one, it's an n by n matrix, so n meaning the number of brain regions that are being studied, and it typically has ones along the diagonal indicating which regions have input being injected into them. U sub kappa is the control input, which is injected into kappa regions at time t. So if we look at the equation one more time, with this additional expression, what we see is that the state of the brain now is a pattern of activity that can flow through structural connections or along structural connections and be modulated by exogenous input uh, to explain what the pattern of activity is in the next time step. Now, I will note that this particular form of the model um, is linear. Uh, it's also time invariant and it is um, noise free. So those are simplifications that can be altered with more um, sophisticated models. However, this is an important one, an easy one to explain initially and an important one to consider as a baseline. So now that I've walked you through the equation, for those who don't like equations, I wanted to provide the same information, uh, but with pictures, and to also deepen the intuition of how this works. So um, what do we mean by a brain state? The way I was using that term in the previous slide was to indicate a pattern of activity across neural units or brain regions. So that's what I'm showing you over here. Here are brain states. They are vectors of activity, um, across neurons or neural ensembles or large-scale brain areas. Each of those states can represent objects, events, experiences, concepts, etc. Now what we'd like to do is to understand how one pattern of activity or one brain state transitions into another brain state. And the way that we are going to understand that is by um, enforcing the fact that activity flows through structural connections. Now, because the activity flows through structural connections, the energy that it takes to get from one brain state to another brain state um, is non-trivial uh, and depends upon where the, the connections exist or where connections don't exist so that you can't take advantage of them and what kind of exogenous input is being added to, to which particular brain regions and what are their, what's their pattern of connections. So when I write this delta E min, what I'm saying is that there's an energy that is required to move from one brain state to another brain state and that energy depends appreciably on where activity can flow, which is defined by the structural connectivity pattern. Okay, so how do we understand the energy required for a set of state transitions? How would we go about defining that E? Well, to do that, I want to focus um, a little bit on how the pattern of activity in the brain relates to the structural connections underneath. So I'm going to give you a couple examples so that I can illustrate when the energy for a state transition is going to be large and when the energy for a state transition is going to be small. So first, what I want you to focus on is this top um, vector. This is a pattern of activity across neural units or a brain state. So here you see that the first three units of the vector are active, the next three units are not active, and the last four units are pretty active. Now the network that exists underneath of this brain state is characterized first by a triangle, so the first three are interconnected with one another, then by a line, and then by a square. And we want to understand the relationship between these two objects. We know that active neurons can spread activity to other neurons around them, and therefore having a large active population is easy if the neurons in that population are connected. If the neurons are not connected, then it will be more difficult to have an active ensemble. Okay, so that helps us to think a little bit about which state network pairs are are, are easy. So in other words, when is it the case that the brain's structural connection pattern helps us to get to a particular activation state? And when does, when does it make it more difficult? So here, if I focus your attention, if you can focus your attention on the left-hand side of the slide where I have an, an easy pair. So here you have the first five units active and the second five units not particularly active. And that activation state is sitting on top of this network, which is, as you can tell, a highly modular network where the first five units are densely interconnected with one another. And the second five units are densely interconnected with one another. And there's only one line in between. For this network to reach this 
or this network can reach this activation state relatively easily because it can capitalize on the structural nature or structural shape or topology of um, the uh, connectivity pattern. So in particular, you can inject an excitatory, generic excitatory signal into the first module, and that will um, activate these first five units. Then you can send a generic inhibitory control signal into the second module, and that will deactivate these units. And because there's very little connectivity between the two modules, we can kind of isolate this one set is active, this set is not active. So the structural connectivity sort of supports and eases the system's attainment of this particular activation state. And I want to contrast that example with two more difficult scenarios. So here on the bottom left, you can see the same state where the first five units are active, the second five units are not particularly active, and but now it sits on a different network. The network that exists now has those two modules, but they're densely interconnected with one another. There's tons of connections going between them. What that means is that as soon as you send an excitatory signal into the first module, all of that activation can flow very easily and quickly into the second module. So keeping the second module quiet requires continued inhibition. So not just one signal, but continued inhibition and sort of fighting against the natural flow of activity that the structure predisposes the system toward. Um, so this is an example of a network that will find it difficult to attain or maintain this particular activation state. I'm going to show you one more example of a difficult state network pair, and then we're going to move to transitions. So here, what I'm showing you is the modular network that we had before. So one module with five units that are densely interconnected with one another, a second module with uh, five units that are densely interconnected with one another, and only one line in between. Now, the state that we would like this network to att uh, attain and maintain is this binary on-off, on-off state. So the first unit is active, second unit is not active, third unit is active, fourth unit is not active, etc. Now, this particular state is hard for this network to attain and maintain because it it works against the structural connectivity. As soon as you activate one of these units, it can spread that activity throughout the module. Um, and therefore, we need to inject either an excitatory or an inhibitory uh, control signal into every single unit in the network to make it reach this binary on off on off state. So now that I've been talking through this slide, you probably have a sense for what I mean by easy or difficult. I am using the terms easy and difficult to indicate the extent, the number, the spatial specificity of the control signals that are required to allow a network to reach a particular state. So easy states or state transitions require fewer control signals, less spatial specificity of them, smaller extent. Um, difficult uh, states or state transitions will require a larger number of control signals or a greater spatial extent or complexity of the control signals. So to show you how that works, I'm going to focus now not just on a single state, but on state transitions. What kind of networks support some state transitions and not others? The network that we're going to focus on is again this modular network that I showed you before with the two modules composed of five nodes and one connection in between. Now, for this network, I already told you that it's easy to attain and maintain this state, which has the first five units on and the second five units off. But now what I'd like to do is not just focus on that single state, but how I can change the system to uh, this state, which is deactivation of the first five and activation of the second five. To do this with this network, all I need is a generic inhibitory control signal injected into the first module and a generic excitatory control signal injected into the second module. And with those two injections, I can flip the states uh, such that Anything that was on initially is now off, and anything that was off initially is now on. And I can maintain that relatively easily because of the sparsity of connections between the modules. Now I want to show you a difficult state transition. So here at the bottom, I have the same modular network, and now I have this binary on-off, on-off state, which we already said was difficult for this network to attain and maintain. But I want to make it even harder and ask the system to switch from this initial state to a state where anything that was on initially is now off, and anything that was off initially is now on. For this particular kind of network to make this state transition, 
it would need an injection of an inhibitory or excitatory control signal into every single node in the network. Um, and because of the number, spatial extent, and complexity of those control signals, this state transition is difficult. So over the last few slides, what I've been focusing on is building intuition for what the network control model is trying to um, study and formalize the study of. Uh, and that formalization can occur in the mathematics that I was describing to you earlier, but I think it's also important to sort of walk through examples to build um, that intuition. Now what I'd like to do is to ask practically, how would we use this model with real neuroimaging data um, to try to understand the uh, capacity for brain dynamics in health, but also interventions in the context of disease. So first I want to ask, what is the input to the system? Hold on, missed a slide. What are the inputs and outputs um, of the network control model? So it's relatively simple. There are two inputs to the network control model. There is a map of the network, so where the structural connections actually exist. And then there's also a model of the dynamics. I was, I've shown you a little bit of both of those things over the last few minutes. I've shown you a map of the network using structural connectivity, and I've shown you a model of the dynamics, which is that simple one on the previous slide. Now, what I haven't shown you is what are the outputs of the network control model? Um, they fall under, there are a range of them, but they fall under a general umbrella of how to design perturbations to push the system to a desired final state. I'm going to walk through each of those inputs and the design of the perturbations to again give you more of a flavor for how this model works. So first, what is a map of the network? Um, for humans, we typically will use diffusion imaging and apply tractography algorithms to that imaging to extract estimates of the structural connectivity between brain regions. But if you're not studying humans, then you would typically use track tracing in the macaque or the mouse, for example, or electron microscopy in cellular level circuits. Now, what about the second input, this model of dynamics? The model of dynamics that I showed you uh, just now is this top one. It is a linear model um, and it's time invariant. Time invariant because the A matrix, the structural connectivity, does not change with time. Now, if you think that the structural connectivity changes with time, then what you want to do is to have a time varying model. And that's what I'm showing you here. So here note that the organization of the equation is the same, um, except that the adjacency matrix can change with time. If you're stud studying something um, at a smaller spatial scale, for example, um, with synapses between neurons, and you're focusing on conditions in which synaptic plasticity is a key factor, then you would want to use a case where the adjacency matrix is time dependent. So one of these time linear time varying models. Now, are those the only two kinds of models that one can use? One in which um, the connections don't change and one in which the connections do change? No, you can actually expand beyond that to include a variety of other more complicated scenarios um, that produce more complicated dynamics that are not, not these linear diffusion-based dynamics. Um, so nonlinear models are also a possibility, and you can use the same network control approaches with uh, models of this varying complexity from the really simple one that I talked to you through initially to um, very complicated nonlinear models. But in any case, no matter which of those models you choose um, to use and which is relevant for your particular question, the underlying idea remains the same, that there's a pattern of activity that moves to another pattern of activity constrained appreciably by a structural pattern of connections, and that that um, relationship helps us to determine how much energy is required for um, state transitions. Okay, so now we've talked through a map of the network and a model of the dynamics as two inputs to the network control theory. Now I'd like to turn to outputs. How do we design perturbations that will move the system in particular ways that help us to understand the system better or help us to um, push the system toward more beneficial uh, dynamics? So here's a slide where I have summarized some of the more common outputs of the network control model. This slide is not meant to be comprehensive, but I think is a will give you a useful flavor for the sorts of questions that we ask in this space. So first, 
I'll note that the very simplest output of the network control model is what's called an impulse response. So this is defined as a system's output when presented with a brief input signal. So basically you ping the network and then you see how activity changes across all nodes in the system and you sum up those activity changes by taking, for example, the area under all of the curves and that provides you with the impulse response of the system. This is useful in determining um, how particular patterns of connectivity alter um, the how the system will respond um, to single pulses. Now, the next or slightly more complicated output of the network control model is what's called the controlled response. So this is the system's response to some controlling input U of T from some initial state X naught. So instead of just pinging the system and allowing it to sort of settle after that single ping, the controlled response actually has a continuous input, U, that changes with time. And what we're trying to do is to understand the system's response to that continuous input. The third um, output of the network control model uh, that's very common is called the controllability. And a system is said to be controllable if there is some control input, so U of T, that brings our system from any initial state to any final state in finite time. So that's a drastic um, possibility that a system can be moved from any initial state to any final state in finite time. Not all networked uh, systems are controllable. However, even for systems that are not fully controllable in that sense, um, we can ask really interesting questions about particular state transitions that are possible for that system and which transitions are easy versus difficult, how much energy needs to be injected to get that tra state transition to occur, um, and then how stable the final state is. So those kinds of questions are what we address in this fourth bullet, which is the, the sort of fourth and final output of the network control model that I wanted to talk to you about. Um, and this is uh, the question of how do I design a control input U of T to minimize the control energy and possibly other factors that are needed to drive the desired response. And here I want to call your attention to the schematic figure on the right hand side of this slide, where we have um, the brain sitting at some initial state X naught. And this gray line is meant to indicate how the brain would naturally move through state space if there were no exogenous inputs. Uh, by contrast, what the network control model is, is seeking to offer us is an understanding of how the brain can be pushed from that initial state to some other final state that wouldn't be the natural state it would go to, but is in response to these exogenous inputs. Now, when we're trying to study that uh, trajectory through state space, what we like to do is to minimize the energy that is required uh, for that state transition. And um, the way that we do that to, to minimize the energy uh, is by uh, posing a minimization problem. I'm showing you that here uh, on the right hand side. So what we'd like to do is to understand this particular trajectory, this hoped for trajectory. Uh, what we do is what we minimize the distance of the current state X from the target state. What that does is just allow for the trajectory to be as straight as possible uh, so that the uh, brain doesn't sort of meander through strange parts of the state space in, in a chaotic way. That's chaotic in the informal sense of the term, not in the uh, formal mathematical sense of the term. So this minimization allows for a straighter trajectory. And then this piece of the minimization um, minimizes the energy that is required to allow this state transition to occur. So U sub kappa is the control input that I've been talking about. And when you take U sub kappa transpose times U sub kappa, that provides you with the energy that's required to allow this state transition to occur. Now, I will note that in this approach, there is a third parameter here that I haven't talked about yet, um, this rho variable. Rho is something that allows you to toggle or control the trade-off between whether you want a relatively straight trajectory or whether you want to minimize energy. Um, and how much do you want each of those things? Typically, 
in most of the um, computational modeling that exists in the literature so far, rho is set at one to just say that both matter equally, the distance that is being traversed and the energy that's required with the transition. But if you um, have additional information from the biology to uh, to determine what rho should be, how much energy minimization matters for that system, um, then you can change rho to be the value that it should be given the biology. Um, I also wanted to just sort of explain why we would want to minimize energy in this simulation to understand trajectories through a state space. There are two key reasons why we want to do that. The first reason is biologically motivated. So we know that the brain is under marked energetic constraints, and there's a long history of beautiful work demonstrating um, those energetic constraints at the level of cellular um, circuits. Because there are marked energetic constraints in the natural system. When we study exogenous input, we also want to minimize the energy that is being used to sort of model the truth of the biology, truth with a small t. Now, in addition to the focus on um, minimizing the energy, we, uh, or for natural biological reasons, when we use these ideas in the context of stimulation, we also want to minimize energy so as not to um, heat the tissue or induce other adverse effects on the system. So those are, those are two different reasons. One is sort of for exogenous uh, interventions, and then the other is just to model the biology. We have used this particular approach in the context of um, electrical stimulation of the brain um, for participants who are for patients who have medically refractory epilepsy. And this work was uh, just published recently. The first author is Jennifer Stiso. Um, and in this study, what we show is that the network control model can explain how electrical stimulation alters the pattern of activity uh, across the brain. Um, and all of that is built upon the underlying structural connectivity that's present for that uh, participant or patient. Okay, so that brings me to um, the uh, conclusion of, of my um, main remarks for this um, lecture, but I wanted to quickly summarize where we've gone over the last few minutes, um, and then we can open it up for questions. So first, I began the lecture by um, stating that the brain is a networked biological system, and that the structural network inside of the brain constrains how activity can flow through the system, thereby influencing the response of the system to stimulation. I then noted that recent efforts have expanded the investigation of structural constraints in three ways. First, They've used increasingly sensitive measurements, and particularly in the human context, that means increasingly sensitive diffusion imaging um, approaches. Secondly, there has been an uh, increasing development of data-informed computational models that can help us to understand how structural connectivity precisely impacts the flow of activity through the system. And then third, there has been a move to embrace a conceptual shift in explanations for the efficacy of stimulation. This is where I noted that um, historically there has been a larger focus on activity-based explanations. So stimulation is efficacious because it alters the local activity right at the point um, that's being studied. And then I remarked that uh, there's also a move to include, not dismiss activity-based explanations, but to also include structure-based explanations. And it's this combination of activity and structure that allows us to better understand um, how stimulation might work. As an example, I showed you the wonderful um, work of Val Sidner uh, demonstrating that the, the strength, the fiber density, the structural connectivity between the VLPFC and the amygdala explains how individual participants respond to transcranial magnetic stimulation. Um, together, these measurement, modeling, and conceptual expansions are providing a richer understanding of structural constraints on neural function and stimulation. And in the final section of the lecture, I focused on one example of these data-informed computational models, and that is the network control model. Um, and what I did in that part was to demonstrate or, or 
illustrate how the network control model works, provide you with an intuition, and then show how the structural connectivity impacts um, how inputs should be injected into the system to drive that system to a particular desired final state and how much energy is required for those state transitions. So with that, I would like to um, thank you all for listening. For those who are interested in this um, final approach, the network control theory approach, I wanted to add a primer on the mathematics, um, a link to the a practical guide to the method if you wanted to use it on your own data, um, a GitHub repository for code, and then also a review article that was just recently published. So with that, thank you so much um, for having me. I'd be happy to take questions. Thank you so much, Professor Bassett. Um, we will have uh, some time for questions, so we'll kick us off. Um, Professor Bornstein, if you could just get to the microphone in the aisles, that way. Yeah. Danny Thank can you, us. Dr. Bassett. That was a fantastic talk. I really appreciate it. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes, I can. Great. Thank you. Okay, cool. So the division um, or the continuum from like difficult to easy control states or difficult to easy uh, network states reminded me of a distinction between sort of complex or highly complex or low complexity policy or state spaces. And I'm wondering if there's an implication in your work about the difficulty of transitioning between difficult and easy states or easy and difficult states that implies there's kind of a gradient in the, in the difficulty of transition from one to the other. So once I perturb a network from an easy state into a difficult state, is it hard to perturb back in the other direction? Hmm. There are a lot of different components of that question. That, that last bit about the asymmetry is really interesting. Um, there can be asymmetric effects uh, when there are when the dynamics are non-Markovian, um, and but I think that's not where we start with the computational models. We will typically begin by suggesting that um, moving from an one state to another will require a similar amount of energy as moving from here. Um, actually, that's not true. That's not true. It's also dependent on the pattern of structural connectivity that's accessible in the opposite direction. So yes, um, it is possible for there to be asymmetries in the energy required for the forward state transition versus the backward state transition. Um, I, you also sort of were asking about whether there are particular, or I heard that you asking if there are, whether there are particular examples of um, this happening and changes in the energy that was required for particular state transitions. I didn't mention this during the talk, but we do have a paper where we apply the this approach to the study of development and particularly the development of executive function in youth between the ages of eight years and 22 years. And in that study, what we show is that the control energy required to um, attain activation of frontal parietal cortex, and particularly a frontal parietal uh, circuit that is um, related to executive function, changes with age such that younger kids, the eight-year-olds, require more energy to activate that circuitry than the 22-year-olds. And um, this is work that was done in collaboration with Ted Satterthwaite here at the Department of Psychiatry in the University of Pennsylvania. And what we Interp the way that we interpret that um, finding is that it's possible that the structural connectivity in youth brains is changing in a way that supports the easier activation of frontal parietal circuitry and that that in turn um, enhances the capacity for executive function. We actually sort of add an additional piece of evidence for that interpretation by demonstrating that um, the, for the participants who require less energy to activate their frontal parietal circuitry, those are also the participants that scored more highly on um, a task battery that assessed executive function. So that's just an example of how you can use these approaches to study differences in, in energy requirements as a function of age, but I would we also have similar studies demonstrating differences in energy requirements in different um, clinical cohorts. So for example, a group of people with schizophrenia versus um, a healthy uh, con matched control group 
Okay, I'm going to keep, I could keep talking, but I'm going to stop and see if there's more questions. Okay, we have a question coming up from Professor Barron. Um, so Professor Bassett, or Danny, uh, this was like actually amazing. I um, have a question about an assumption about the structure. And again, you showed us this magnificent um, a correlation of density of fiber tracts and structural connectivity, presumably making the assumption that we can explain structural connectivity through looking at diffusion uh, imaging and looking at tracts. But as a neuroscientist, I sort of think that there is uh, information transfer, for example, by interneuron all through, through you know, uh, electrical uh, synapses and what have you, and also the degree of connectivity of a given fiber may very much different. For example, again, interneurons can um, uh, connect with thousands of um, targets, whereas a pyramidal cell will only do 50 or 60 or what have you. So how do you feel about the correlation of the structural connectivity as measured using current imaging versus the quote unquote true structural connectivity that um, maybe is applicable to your models? Yes, um, thank you for that question. Uh, I'll take it in, in the two parts that you described. So first, um, you are suggesting that the uh, it's important to acknowledge the fact that um, activity can flow in ways that are not structure based. So um, in the methods paper that I mentioned just on the very last slide, we discuss that um, and in the human case, what we do is that we include a second kind of connection in the adjacency matrix. And that is a connection that's not defined by um, the white matter tracks that we can estimate from diffusion imaging, but it's defined by physical abutment of two regions to one another that would allow for a flow of electrical impulses between them. So these two regions are not, you know, they're not isolated. The brain isn't composed of balls um, and sticks. It is composed, it's a tissue it's you know full and completely connected. So um, understanding which regions are butting up against one another and um, as conduits of information flow is really important. So we expand the control model in that paper to include not only structural connectivity as estimated from diffusion imaging, but also this abutment matrix that allows uh, for a different kind of flow between regions. And I think in um, future work, including both sorts of connections is really important because it's more true to the biology as you, as you remark. The second bit of your question was related to um, sort of synaptic, uh, specificity, the um, incorporation of inhibitory neurons, and differences in the patterns of connectivity at the cellular scale in inhibitory neurons versus others. That's a really important question as well. The model that I showed you today is one that um, I focused on just uh, excited or positive connections, not inhibitory connections, but we do have papers that we have published that um, put a sign, an either a positive or negative sign on each of the edges, and that impacts how information can flow through the system and how much energy is required for particular state transitions. That inclusion of a sign on the edges is really important for cellular level uh, circuit studies. It's not something that we necessarily can measure well um, at the large scale in humans. Uh, so this is maybe just to note that the model can be expanded to include excitatory and inhibitory connections, and um, we have we have done so, and I think that that's an important thing to uh, consider when these models are being used at smaller spatial scales. Thank you. We have time for other questions. As folks are sort of thinking about their questions, maybe I'll I'll bring one up, uh, Danny. That I uh, so. Today, you talked a lot about structure, and of course, you've done a lot of work also on function and functional transitions and, and, and functional states. And I'm curious, there's one particular type of potentially, call it communication, sort of quote unquote communication, that has to do with brain oscillations. And how does one start to kind of bring that into the picture and think about that potentially as another means by which you can have communication across perhaps not physically interconnected structurally, um, regions and networks, but maybe more distant regions that may be communicating through this modality? Yeah, um, that's a really good question too. In um, in Jenny Stiso's work that I mentioned just toward the end, where we ev evaluate 
uh, or model electrical stimulation in patients with medically refractory epilepsy, the states that we are studying are power, in particular frequency bands. Um, so to some degree, indirectly capturing um, oscillatory dynamics and the strength of oscillatory dynamics in particular frequency bands. Um, but I think beyond that, what you are asking is, are there alternative assessments of uh, the capacity for information flow between regions beyond the structural connectivity, which I focused on today, and beyond the you know, physical um, touching that I mentioned in response to the previous question? The answer is yes. So um, we have a few studies in which we have used estimates of effective connectivity between brain regions, and that is derived from functional imaging data. Um, What's important, I would, and I want to mark a distinction between effective connectivity and what's commonly called functional connectivity. So one of the common ways of assessing functional connectivity is to calculate a correlation between two time series. This sort of correlation matrix or correlation-based network typically has many triangles in it, um, such that you, you know, A is correlated with B and B is correlated with C and therefore C is correlated with A, for example. Um, that uh, the, the nature of triangles means that the it is, it is not the case that func most functional connectivity measures, like a correlation, can really assess the, the independent pairwise relationships between uh, regions. And in order to accurately model flow of activity, we need as real estimates of um, dyadic interactions or pairwise relationships with as much precision as possible. And therefore the, re the removal of these sort of artificial triangles from statistical relationships. So effective connectivity in contrast to functional connectivity is an approach that allows for you to remove unnecessary triangles that are statistically um, driven and estimate just you know, how two regions in, in a pair are relating to one another. So we have used that in a couple studies now to um, instead, or as the adjacency matrix, instead of the structural connectivity. And we do that particularly in cases where the we think that the pattern of information flow is changing really appreciably. So, and therefore needs to be accounted for in a time varying adjacency matrix. The example that I'll just mention right now is in the context of epilepsy, when um, people move from an initiation of the seizure through propagation of the seizure and then to termination of the seizure. These are three um, wildly different dynamical regimes when you look at um, the electrophysiological uh, activity. And so, uh, and the and the sort of way in which information is flowing is clearly also very different. So, what we did in the study that just came out in the proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, I think last year, um, late last year, is that we took the early part of the seizure, the middle part of the seizure, and the late part of the seizure, and extracted or estimated effective connectivity matrices for each one. So we had three effective connectivity matrices. And then we use that as the input to the network control model to say, where should we be stimulating if we can stimulate early in the seizure? Where should we be stimulate if we're stimulating in the middle of the seizure? Where should we be stimulating if we stimulate late in the seizure? And the answer is different because the effective connectivity is different. That's very helpful. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Oh, um, uh, there is something in the Q&A, but I'm not sure I can control that there's no mouse here. <laughs> I have a question from oh, online. Okay. Oh, it uh, says, hi, Dr. Bassett. Thank you for the fascinating talk. I'm curious about some of the higher complexity models you've considered for studying state transitions and control. For studying whole brain activity, we often draw ROIs across the brain to segment activity into nodes, but of course, activity occurs at the neuron level. Have you found multi-scale models that incorporate neuron heterogeneity or even individual neuron activity, useful or, inter uh, useful or interesting for studying the scale of activity and dynamics? Yeah, so we, we have definitely used the network control approach um, on cellular level data. This is in collaboration with Anne Grabiel and Teresa Disrochers from Brown and Grabiel from MIT. Um, and so they both uh, work with macaque monkeys and uh, study many things, but among them habit formation. 
And so what we did is that we used that uh, data collected while uh, macaques are developing habits to ask what the energetic requirements are to build a habit. And our hypothesis was that as habits are being built, the energy that's required to make particular state transitions decreases. And that's that, that's tracking the habit becoming more of a habit um, and more sort of, of an automatic um, activity. And that is that is indeed what we found. Um, so that's just an example of using this particular approach, but with lower level, you know, cellular level data. Um, but I, I think maybe I also want to answer your question in a, in a second way. Um, and that is thinking about biological features of individual brain regions that could inform how they are processing and sharing information with one another uh, and responding to stimulation. So right now, the model that I showed you sort of assumes that every region is the same, only distinguishable by its pattern of connectivity. But we know that that's not true in the brain. Different regions of the brain um, are distinct in terms of their uh, tissues, tissue structure, their cytoarchitecture, uh, the kinds of neurotransmitters that are prevalent, um, the kinds of neurons that are there. So all of those uh, more specific um, uh, differences between brain regions are not currently incorporated in the model that I showed you. However, there is a recent paper that I'm really excited about, and I was not part of, um, but it was, I just think it's really neat. Um, it's by Singleton Parker and uh, other colleagues. And what they do is that they take that B matrix that I showed you, uh, that's multiplied by the control input U, they, instead of putting ones along the diagonal to indicate it, which regions actually have stimulation being injected into them, they uh, put densities of uh, neurotransmitters there. And, and the reason that they, dis and individual regions, how, how they differ in terms of their uh, particular neurotransmitters, I think they focused on serotonin. Um, and I think this is really interesting because it suggests that that feature of the biology, but I think also lots of other features of the biology, will alter how the region responds to stimulation and also shares that stimulation with other regions. So I'm excited in the next couple of years to do more studies and see more studies that incorporate uh, some additional biological specificity in the B matrix or maybe elsewhere to allow us to better understand how those factors impact or explain um, the variables that we are interested in. Any other questions? David, Professor Keeter. Oh, hi, Dr. Bassett. My name is Dave Keeter. A great talk. Um, so I was wondering um, if you've thought about, you know, thinking about the pairwise functional connectivity between pairs of brain regions, you know, conditioning on um, the functional connectivity from all other regions on that pair. Have you thought about using the sparse inverse covariance matrix methods to, to do that? And what do you think about using that along with the structural connectivity matrix to weight some of these things? And then my second question was, in that model with the row parameter the trade off between distance and energy, I was wondering if you could test that empirically with a fixed TMS, applying different input energies and measuring the output of the system and kind of get a sense of what that row parameter would be for different mental health conditions. Yeah, the short answer is yes and yes. Um, but the longer answer is that yes, we have um, used the uh, inverse covariance matrix in a paper that, a different paper that uh, Jennifer Stiso wrote on um, brain computer interface learning. And um, so I think that that is a reasonable approach. We have found that we get sort of nicer. Um, cleaner matrices using transfer entropy and the cellular level data. Um, I think part of that is because the fMRI data is just, is, is short often. Um, and so even though you can calculate the inverse covariance matrix, it doesn't mean that you have um, high certainty on the estimates of individual elements inside of the matrix. So I think my personal assessment is that I'm, it works, but I, I would like clearer, uh, per, clearer confidence intervals around each of the estimated elements, I suppose. <laughs>
and then some reasonable way of incorporating them into the model um, with some sort of uncertainty quantification and propagation of that uncertainty throughout the system or throughout the, the modeling um, approach. The second uh, question you had has now left me. It was about the trade-off between the distance and energy and if you could test that row oh, parameter yeah, or humans. learn that row parameter. Yeah, I think that's a really great idea. It's not something that we have done, um, but I think that it is something that would be great to try. Yeah, I feel like yeah, somebody should do that. That's a great idea. Yeah, because they would tell you, you know, like there's energy transfer differences in say schizophrenia compared to someone with, you know, PTSD. You might yeah. Know. Yeah. Might yeah. Yeah. I have another question from online. How does NTC account for indirect network interactions such as preemptive priming of a certain network area that might change the way that particular area responds or interacts with subsequent network stimuli? Yeah, that's a really good question. I think that the way that we would do that is, well, there are two ways. One is using the effective connectivity matrix approach that I was describing earlier in response to um, Mike's question. But the second way uh, that you can do that is by incorporating what we're calling a context matrix um, in addition to the structural connectivity. And that context matrix um, can you can inform that by what you know about um, priming effects, perhaps from other kinds of imaging data or from other experiments even. So um, there are two ways of doing it, uh, both of which I think are, are really interesting and important. Thank you. So if there are no additional questions, maybe I'll just ask one sort of final future looking question. And, um, it, you know, it strikes me, and you've stated several times, of course, that it is a, a simplified model when we think about um, linear uh, time invariant models, and then we can sort of upgrade that to going to more time varying models, and then the, the much more complex set of nonlinear models that can be applied. And the question is, as you start to think about the application of this throughout systems in the brain, do you envision a future where you might be able to use the expansion of these models to essentially explain everything? <laughs> You're a positivist. I'm um, trying. There's a lot of trainees <laughs> here. I'm trying to leave them with maybe a positive message. Yeah, I mean, that's a really good question. I, I think I, um, so I'm a physicist by training and I value, like most people of my ilk, I value simple models um, that allow us to draw broad, uh, coarse-grained explanations for complex phenomena. And so I do feel that this approach has the beauty of simplicity on its side. Um, as we expand it to incorporate more biological realism, I think that that will help us to address um, more very, some very specific questions and also won't be necessary for other questions. So I think it's, for me, model complexity is not always a good um, it needs to be evaluated at each point to ask, you know, how much am I gaining? What benefit does this offer in terms of explanatory specificity? Um, and so, so there's that. I think that um, will we explain everything? I, not in my lifetime. But. but we can still try to make a dent in it. And you've done a tremendous job uh, doing that thus far. So thank you. Thank you. Thanks for listening. And great to see you, Danny. We will break and we'll come back in 15 or 20, 20 minutes. Thank you, Danny.